Hi, uh, I'm Jonathan Weisberg. I'm an associate professor in the philosophy department at the University of Toronto. And I'm Mike Teitelbaum, also an associate professor in the philosophy department at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And we are here to talk about Bayesianism. And eventually we're going to get into a conversation about subjective versus objective Bayesianism. But first we thought we should talk a little bit about what Bayesianism is and how the two of us see how Bayesianism has been evolving over the last few decades or so. Um, so we're going to start just by talking about what Bayesianism is. So Jonathan, do you want to try? Sure, that? yeah. Um, so I tend to think of Bayesianism as, um, at least in epistemology, I think of Bayesianism as any approach that takes probability to be really central to understanding um, knowledge, justification, and inquiry. Um, and especially in epistemology, it's important how probabilities change over time or as new ev evidence and information comes in. Um, but Bayesianism also, there's, it's sort of a big octopus kind of thing that extends into other areas. Um, and so there's also Bayesian decision theory, and you were mentioning the other day at lunch, Bayesian approaches to cognitive science. Um, and in those places, Bayesianism tends to have um, a somewhat different meaning about how probabilities get used, and especially which equations and which formulas are more central um, to deciding what to do or to um, drawing statistical inferences. Um, so it's not, there, I don't know if there's one single definition that covers all the domains, but at least in epistemology, I would say any approach that takes probability is central and the changes the, that probability undergoes in the light of new evidence. Right. I think also there's, there's a community of Bayesians, right? <laughs> and so among the various issues that would be tied to what you just said, there's a history of what the, the tribe that calls itself the Bayesians <laughs> has been most concerned about thinking about at any given time. Yeah. yeah, it's almost as much a sociological category as an <laughs> right. ideological one, yeah, yeah. Right, and interestingly, sometimes you will have more agreement about who considers themselves the Bayesians than you will actually have about what it takes to be a <laughs> Bayesian, right. right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We agree that we're both Bayesians, but completely disagree about what, what the right kind of yes. understanding of that is, yeah. Right, okay. and, and that's not idiosyncratic to us. That's, <laughs> that's a long-running thing right. among Bayesians. Yeah. Um, yeah. So one of the things, at, in terms of historically, what Bayesians have been interested in talking about is I think there used to be a lot more concern about what was known as interpretations of probability. Mm -hmm. And that was a set of questions about, first of all, what is probability mm -hmm. as a sort of metaphysical entity or category or whatever you would want to call it. And then also some semantic questions about when you s make assertions that involve the word probability or other words like probable, likely, etc. Mm -hmm. what exactly have you said? Mm -hmm. And clearly those two topics are related in various ways. Right, yeah. And so what, what would you say were the main interpretations or understandings about what probabilistic talk might have meant, um, at least when Bayesianism, in the Bayesian tradition, what were the leading ways of understanding probability. Right. So one of the oldest ones is that when you make an assertion about probability, this is sometimes known as the classical interpretation, mm -hmm. you are just counting the number of favorable outcomes out of the number of total possible outcomes. So if I say the probability that when I roll this die it will come up one is one-sixth, mm -hmm. a very classical way of understanding what I just said is there are six possible outcomes to the die roll, assuming it's a six-sided die, and one of them winds up with the die roll coming up one, and mm -hmm. so that's why the probability is one-sixth. Mm -hmm. um, that went out of fashion <laughs> yeah. early in the 20th century, <laughs> if not earlier, right? Yeah. So there's the classical interpretation of probability. Um, probabilities are sometimes interpreted as making statements about frequencies. Mm -hmm. So another way to understand the statement about the die roll is if I rolled this die many times, roughly one-sixth of the time, it would come up one. Mm -hmm. Um, there are various wrinkles about how to understand that, and because obviously if I rolled it a thousand times, you are almost guaranteed that, well, with a thousand times, you are mathematically <laughs> guaranteed that it won't be one-sixth of them come up one. So then there are some wrinkles about are we talking about some kind of frequency in the limit or something. Mm -hmm. um, so there's the classical interpretation, the frequency interpretation. Then you get into interpretations about so-called chances or propensities, mm -hmm. that there is something about the physical construction of the die that gives it some sort of propensity to come up mm -hmm. one, um, and that there's a way to measure that propensity, and the measure is one-sixth. Right. right, so if you had a coin that kind of was lopsided and so it tended to land heads more often, it would be that something about that lopsided structure of the coin that kind of yeah. pushed it in the headsy direction, and that's why it would be probability 
two thirds instead of one half that it comes up heads. Right. Exactly, yeah. something about the coin and plus the laws of physics, etc., interacts right. to create this propensity. So all those interpretations I just mentioned would count traditionally as objective interpretations mm -hmm. of probability. And what we're going to get into eventually is that when you talk about objective versus subjective Bayesianism, there's actually a couple different ways you can use that distinction. Mm -hmm. So I think we've agreed to call this way of using the distinction the descriptive distinction. Mm -hmm. So the descriptive distinction between objective and subjective Bayesianism is all the characterizations I just gave are objective in that they see probability as being something out in the world, mm -hmm. right? There's something about the physical structure of this coin or if this die was rolled a certain number of times, there's a fact of the matter about how it would come up or mm -hmm. something like that. Um, and so those are all objective interpretations of probability. And it used to be that the people who would argue that probability talk expresses one of these objective interpretations, those people were known as the objective Bayesians, mm -hmm. right? right? Then there was another way to interpret probability talk and perhaps the metaphysics of what probabilities are. Mm -hmm. And this is the subjective Bayesians would say that probability talk involves attitudes that agents have towards propositions or towards events. Mm -hmm. And so for instance, when I say the probability that this die roll will come up one is one sixth, what I have just done is somehow indicate my degree of confidence mm -hmm. that the die roll will come up one. And in particular, I've said my degree of confidence is one sixth, mm -hmm. if you're going to measure it numerically. Right. right. And so how would you measure a subjective probability, a, a level of confidence? How would you measure something that's subjective like that? Right. So one, you know, w one of the original ways that you find in people like Ramsey, um, and then going on into a lot of decision theorists is a good way to measure what someone's degree of belief in a proposition is, is to offer to make a gamble on that proposition and see what kinds of stakes they're willing to accept. Right. So if I take two to one odds on horse A winning, then I'm two thirds confident that that horse is going to win. Exactly. Right. Okay. Right. Um, and do you have a sense of sort of what drove people, at least early on in the Bayesian history, what drove people towards one interpretation of probability objective say rather than the subjective kind well early on right that that's an interest i mean you know very very early mm -hmm. on when we were first just trying to struggle to develop probability mathematics mm -hmm. sort of when you look at a lot of the historical people who were working on it Bernoulli and people like that sort of the first thing that came to mind was let's just count the number of outcomes yeah so that generated the seems like the natural way to treat a lot of Right. The classic examples when you're doing rolling dice, doing coin tosses, it just seems like the counting gives right. you the right answers. Right. So it's it seems like that's thing. a yeah. plausible way of starting. Right. Yeah. But then um, you get cases where like a coin is only ever tossed once, right? So one out of one tosses, it's let's say heads, right? And then 100%, one out of one are heads. But that doesn't seem like it had to be 100% probability that it would come up heads. So then people start to get uncomfortable with counting and frequency ways of thinking of probability. And maybe that's one thing that pushes you to think, well, it's more that before the coin flipped, I thought could have gone either way, mm -hmm. equally likely. And so that's when it becomes a, it seems to me that it's a subjective matter. Yeah. I mean, I don't know that historically what I'm about to say was one of the influences, but certainly to me now, another important influence is you talk about certain sorts of events or propositions that could really only happen once. Right. So you will find a physicist saying things like, well, given the evidence we have now, it's more probable than not that, say, the universe began with a Big Bang. Right. Or perhaps more recently, that the universe is going to keep expanding forever. Mm -hmm. As long as you think there's one universe, <laughs> that's not the kind of thing that could repeat over and over. So it's hard to interpret that kind of probability talk as talking about the frequency in, mm -hmm. in a repeated event, because it's clearly not going to repeat, it's also a little bit tricky to understand that along the lines of the propensity interpretation, mm -hmm. because propensities are supposed to spring out of what the physical laws are. Mm -hmm. And if you start talking about what is the probability that the physical laws are one way rather than another, mm -hmm. it's unclear where such propensities could come from, right. what could even generate them. There's also the fact that we say we have these formulations like relative to our current evidence, the probability is such and such. Mm -hmm. And that makes it sound perhaps a lot more like what's going on is you're reporting or expressing something about the attitude you've adopted towards a proposition mm -hmm. in light of what you know at this point. And right. that perhaps begins to sound more subjective. So in, in recent days, for example, a lot of epistemologists and philosophers of religion, they argue about, you know, 
how likely is it that God exists given the evidence we have? And that's something there where presumably, you know, whether God exists is not a matter. God chose the laws of nature. It's not, those the laws of nature don't determine the probability that God existed. It's rather just sort of what should we think given the information we have available to us. Mm -hmm. um, and that illustrates, I think, both the points you're just picking up on. Right, you're, exactly. you're Especially there. that's an important one because there are arguments, for instance, the argument from miracles or the argument from design that have been interpreted historically going back to human people like that mm -hmm. as being about probabilities. Right. But it's really hard to square a lot of the objective personality probability interpretations with understanding what's going on. Some of those yeah. Arguments. Yeah. And so these days, I guess you and I probably agree that these days, um, this debate between whether probability should be understand, understood in the subjective way or the objective mm -hmm. way, like the frequency way, it's kind of, it's, Conver people have converged on a, a what I would call a pluralism where they think actually you know probability that word in in ordinary usage and maybe in scientific discourse has a f has all of those meanings and there are multiple kinds of probability and then the real question is just you know in in different contexts which ones are um, which ones are the ones that we're talking about which ones are important um, and then especially in these days philosophers especially in epistemology are interested in when, when we're talking about subjective probability what are the rules that ought to guide and govern the way we kind of reason with those subjective probabilities. Right. I think there's been a lot of agreement that no matter what you wind up saying about what the word probability does in certain forms of language, and even once you have conceded that there are things out in the physical universe like probabilities, mm -hmm. there is still a really interesting topic. What are these subjective degrees of belief? What are these attitudes mm -hmm. that people have? What are the norms that govern them? How strong are those norms? Et cetera, et cetera. So we're no, there, we're no longer in an age where if you want to talk about degrees of belief, you have to start by arguing that the only way the word probability ever gets used is to talk about degrees <laughs> of belief. There are no objective probabilities. Right. And, and there, you don't have to do all that. You can concede that there are objective probabilities. You can just say, look, I'm interested in focus on, focusing on what's going on with degrees of belief. Right. So whereas an early Bayesian like Definetti would have been really concerned to try and translate all talk of objective probability into subjective terms, um, people nowadays seem much more comfortable with just saying, well, look, it just seems to me way more plausible that, you know, two plus two equals four than that, uh, you know, right. it'll be rainy tomorrow. I just I can just feel that I'm more confident in one of those than the other. Um and so they're much more ready to talk about subjective probability, whether or not the objective probability is another kind of real probability. Um, and I guess along with that comes the move away from a lot of the um, operational or behaviorist and positivist origins of, um, of Bayesian epistemology, which historically have tied it very closely with decision theory. Mm -hmm. And I get the sense that that, that connection is starting to weaken. At least people, while they still think they, there's a lot of interaction, you don't necessarily have to start with decision making and behavior and what odds would I give on a horse to decide what right. your subjective probabilities are. Yeah, I would say that as we moved away from positivism and operationalism in general in epistemology, right? Mm -hmm. Most people don't feel you need a definition of belief anymore in terms mm -hmm. of if you believe P, then these are the actions <laughs> you're going to write. Um, yeah. I think we've epistemologists who work on degrees of belief or credences have become more comfortable seeing these as mental attitudes that sort of have a reality of their own on a par with traditional beliefs. Mm -hmm. And so just as we don't have to be operationalist about what it is to have a traditional belief, mm -hmm. we don't have to be that way in terms of degrees of belief. And so you don't have to say there is exactly one way to measure degrees of belief. It's your betting odds. Right. You know, it's not. You have these things and perhaps if you're rational, they will interact with your betting odds in particular ways, but yeah. it's not how to define them anymore. Right, and along with that, with that shift about how should we define or operationalize degrees of belief, there's a shift in the way people argue for the fundamental rules behind Bayesian, uh, behind Bayesian reasoning. It used to be that you would argue like, well, look, if your if your odds on horse horse A winning are two to one, then your odds against have to be, um, you know one third, otherwise there's going to be this inconsistency and someone could take advantage of you by setting up some clever bets and then you'd lose money no matter whether your horse won or lost. That was the traditionally one of the most common ways of arguing for saying that subjective probabilities ought to obey certain rules, like, you know, you should have two thirds for or one third against. Are. Yeah, right. so I, I always think that the most fundamental rule is the one that says, you know, if you're two thirds for, be one third against. That's, to me, that one that really defines sort of the Bayesian conception of uh, degree of belief. Right. Um,
but now are, in, there are other things like yeah. perhaps two propositions are logically equivalent you should be equally confident of them right if uh, if a proposition is logically necessary then you should be maximally confident in it mm -hmm. um, we should probably say something else just for people who don't know about what happened to the word probability when mathematicians use it yeah. So there is now in mathematics an axiomatized theory, the theory of probabilities. Mm -hmm. And for mathematicians, what it is to be a probability is to be a numerical function that satisfies mm -hmm. particular um, mathematical axioms, most typically some version of Kolmogorov's axioms. Mm -hmm. And so when mathematicians say something is a probability, mm -hmm. they say it's a numerical function that satisfies these axioms. Mm -hmm. They don't care whether it's about propensities or chickens or, you know, who cares, right? Whereas when philosophers talk about what probability is, mm -hmm we're saying something about propensities or perhaps we're saying something about degrees of belief. Right. But there is this interesting connection that most Bayesians think that there are these rules on what rational degrees of belief look like mm -hmm. that be, can be connected up to the mathematical rules that constitute what mathemat mathematicians call a probability. Function. Right, yeah. Right. And so when it comes to applying those, to, to describing or justifying those rules which govern mm -hmm. subjective probabilities that govern degrees of belief, Nowadays, it seems like the approach is, is much more focused, it's not focused so much on decision making and laying of bets, but rather focused on purely epistemic concerns, getting at the truth, discovering the way the world really is. And so there's this whole research program that's exploded in the last 10, 20 years, where people are concerned to argue that the reason, um, you know, if two propositions are logically equivalent, you should have the same, prop same degree of belief in each, um, is that that is a better way of getting at the truth than anything that violates that rule right um and actually do you want to maybe sort of explain some of the basic some of the, yeah. the standard theorems that have been proved in this area right sure so this is a sort of accuracy based approach to uh justifying the mathematical rules on mm -hmm. degrees of confidence and what it starts with is if you're going to start assessing these attitudes in a sort of purely epistemological way, and so not in terms of their consequences for action, mm -hmm. one of the questions you want to ask is, how accurate is the degree of belief? How good a job are you doing at getting to the truth with that degree of belief? Mm -hmm. With full beliefs, it's kind of, it looks pretty easy how to measure that kind of thing, right? If you believe a proposition and it's true, then that belief is accurate. Mm -hmm. If you disbelieve a proposition and the proposition is false, then your disbelief is accurate. Mm -hmm. Um, so with beliefs, it's pretty straightforward to see how you could kind mm -hmm. of talk about accuracy. For degrees of belief, the, the, the idea people tend to go with is you want to be close to the truth. Mm -hmm. So what it means to be accurate is if I have a high degree of belief in P and P turns out to be true in the actual world, mm -hmm. then that's pretty accurate as, of me. Whereas if I had had a lower degree of belief in that same proposition, then that would have been a less accurate degree of belief on mm -hmm. my part. And similarly, if you want to be accurate, you want to have low degrees of belief in falsehoods. Mm -hmm. The higher your degree of belief in a falsehood, the worse you're doing from an accuracy point of view. So the first step in these results is you have to be able to measure the accuracy of degrees of belief mm -hmm. relative to how conditions turn out in the world. Mm -hmm. And there's some debate, which we'll get to a little bit later, about exactly how to do that, because mm -hmm. there are some mathematical details. But let's just suppose you have a mathematical way of measuring how close, how accurate a degree of belief is given the degree of belief and what conditions are like in the actual world. Well, one of the really interesting results you can get is that if your degree of belief doesn't satisfy certain rules, like this rule that if you're two thirds for, you should be one third against, mm -hmm. then what's going to happen is from your own point of view, you will be able to look at the degrees of belief you assign and then look at the degrees of belief someone else could assign and realize that no matter how the world turns out, whatever possible world it is that you two live in, Mm -hmm. that person is going to be more accurate than you. Mm -hmm. And moreover, you're always going to be, if you violate the rules, you're always going to be able to imagine another person who satisfies the rules, mm -hmm. who no matter how the world turns out is doing better than you. Mm -hmm. That kind of argument is available for at least the rules that come from Kolmogorov's probability axioms. Mm -hmm. And that looks to a lot of people like a pretty strong argument that if you're violating the, the probability axioms, the Kolmogorov axioms, then you're doing poorly from an accuracy point of view. Mm -hmm. Because by your own light, you're going to be able to tell that you could be doing better. Mm -hmm. And you're going to, in fact, construct a set of degrees of belief that would do better in every possible world and that satisfies the rules. And if you can see that there's a way you could do better, 
why not just go and do better? Why not go do that thing over there? So it's going to look bad for you by your own lights if you're not following the rules. Right, and that's the the accuracy domination argument. The idea yes. is that no matter what happens in any possible scenario, mm -hmm. a different way of arranging your beliefs would dominate the way you've arranged your beliefs now. So it seems like the way you're doing things now is just bad no matter what. Um, and as you said, you can give that kind of argument in favor of the most basic rules of probability, Kolmogorov's axioms, which say, you know, if something's logically true, be 100% certain of it. If you're two thirds four, be one third against. Um, but then there are further rules that can't be extracted from just considerations of dominance. It seems like you're going to have to use a more substant, add a more substantive rule in if you want to get a more substantive rule out. Right. Um, so, for example, one result recently is Richard Pettigrew uh, has argued that um, there's actually a motivation for a classic principle in uh, probability, which says that. If there, there are three possible outcomes, you should attribute you know, one-third probability to each. If there are six possible outcomes, you should attribute probability one-sixth to each, like with a roll of a die. Um, and those assignments of probabilities can't be derived from the kind of dominance argument you just gave, but they can be derived from an argument which says, well, suppose you wanted to minimize your risk of being inaccurate. So you wanted to adopt a set of probabilities which, in the worst case scenario, um, aren't that far off from the truth. Right. And if that's the if that's the decision your your if that's the your way of deciding what probabilities to assign, um, then you get the principle of indifference. Mm -hmm. um, but only if you strengthen if you go beyond the the dominance reasoning and go for a, a bit more of a substantive rule about how to choose your probabilities. Right. Another example of that is another rule you could go for is you could try to minimize your expected inaccuracy mm -hmm. by your own lights. Um, so you're not sure if you go over to this other plan or approach or whatever that you're going to do better, but it looks like given what you currently believe about which world is likely to turn out to be actual, mm -hmm. when you look at that, it looks to you like you expect that other approach to do better than yours. And this minimizing expected inaccuracy, for instance, was used in a result by Greaves and Wallace mm -hmm. to argue for a rule known as conditionalization, mm -hmm. where conditionalization is a rule about how your degrees of belief should change over time when you gain new evidence. Mm -hmm. And what they argued is, if you're sitting here and you don't know what evidence you're going to be getting, say you know you're about to conduct an experiment, and the experiment can only come out so many different ways, mm -hmm. you don't know which way it's going to come out. But say you're sitting here and you want to form a plan for once the experimental results come in, how are you going to change your degrees of belief? Mm -hmm. There are a bunch of different plans you could form. One of them is, I'm going to enact this conditionalization rule. And out of all the plans you could possibly form, the one that you will expect to give you the most accurate credences mm -hmm. is the, the updating by conditionalization rule or anything equivalent to it. So right. if your norm is, I want to minimize expected inaccuracy, then you're going to be able to get an argument for this conditionalization updating norm. Right, yeah. Um, and that, that conditionalization norm, that's one, that's one of those norms that, uh, like the Kolmogorov axioms, it used to be defended frequently by appeal to um, gambling considerations. And here, it's being, appeal it's being defended instead by considerations of trying to get at the truth. And this is right. one of the kind of central Bayesian ideas, is that the best way to get at the truth is by using probabilities and changing them in light of information. And one of the neat theorems you get here, as you say, is the Greaves and Wallace one, which says this is the formula that tells you how to change probabilities with new information, which is, loosely speaking, most likely to get you closer to the truth. Right. By um, lights. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, though I gather, I mean, so there's a bit of a debate going on right now about whether or not there really are any rules about how um, subjective probabilities should change over time, mm -hmm. whether or not, um, you know, what I believe right now and, you know, what I believe in a minute are related in it or have to be related in any normative way or whether you know what I believe right now doesn't necessarily affect what I should believe in a moment yes so this is sometimes known as the time slicing theory, right yeah right um, and there's this position the time slicing position <laughs> right that says that what is rational for you to do at any given moment is not beholden to how you actually were at past moments mm -hmm. um, and so really, there are not any genuinely diachronic updating norms, any norms that say what you do now ought rationally to be connected to what you did in the past in any particular ways. The mm -hmm. time slicing view says, look, you are where you are now. You have the evidence you have. Mm -hmm. You should be responding to that evidence in an appropriate way. Um, but you're in no way beholden you know, to how you saw that evidence mm -hmm. 10 minutes ago. Right. 
Um, and I think if you look at the various, part of this comes out of, if you look at the various arguments for updating norms like conditionalization. So the way I just characterized the accuracy argument for conditionalization, I said, okay, you're right here. You're going to get the evidence. You're looking at a bunch of plans that you could possibly enact. Mm -hmm. By your lights right now, this is the plan that looks the best. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now wait however long it takes for you to run the experiment. You've run the experiment. The evidence has come in. Mm -hmm. The question is, at this point, you can say, look, I get that two hours ago that plan looked like it would be the best plan, but why is the present me beholden to do what looked mm -hmm. like the best idea according to the past me? I mean, for one thing, present me has more evidence. Right. I know things that guy didn't, mm -hmm. so why am I you know, beholden to what he did? And so if you don't have some kind of basic underlying norm that says what you do at later times and earlier times needs to line up in some rational way. Mm -hmm. If you don't start with some kind of assumption like that, the various arguments for conditionalization and various other updating norms mm -hmm. don't seem to get off the ground to begin with. Right. And there's so you already touched on there's one sort of motivation for this way of this slicey way of thinking where you think, well, what I thought a moment ago doesn't matter. What matters is what my evidence says right now is this connects with a broader theme in epistemology outside of Bayesianism, the evidentialist view, the idea that what you should believe is determined by what evidence you have and what the evidence says. So, you know, whatever I thought a moment ago, I should just look at my evidence and believe whatever it tells me. But the other, on the other hand, there's, um, there's a, kind of pointing in the other direction, there's a concern that you've touched on in, in some of your work where um, if there's nothing constraining how, you know, if what I believed a moment ago doesn't constrain what I should believe now, then you might end up getting things where people's beliefs can kind of fluctuate over time, and I can believe one thing in a moment, and then you can ask me the same question a few minutes later, and I can say, oh yeah, no, forget what I said three seconds ago, and now I think it's false. Right. Um, and then, so then you, you get into this problem of if there are no diachronic rules, no rules across time like conditionalization, what is it that keeps us from just right. waffling back and forth? Right. Yeah. And I think we're going to get to one answer to that later, right? Yeah. There so is one should... possible answer we'll get to. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, one of, one of the things we've moved into without sort of highlighting that we, we were doing so is I think we've sort of moved from talking about what Bayesianism is mm -hmm. to talking about some of the topics that people are currently working on right. in Bayesianism. Yeah. Um, and this is, you know, these things change over time. So you wrote a, an article right, a little while back called You've Come a Long Way, Bayesians. <laughs> right. And that was sort of you characterizing some of the hot topics, some mm -hmm. of the things that were going on in Bayesianism at that point. Mm -hmm. But these things are sort of fluid over time. Yeah. So some of those things people are still working on, some of them there. And again, go back to this idea of Bayesians as a tribe. And it's not that <laughs> certain topics are better than others, but the tribe sort of shifts its attention right. over time. It wanders through the desert. <laughs> right. Alights on new locations. To join. So I, I would say sort of the, the things that people are really working on these days a lot, there's a lot of people working on accuracy, yeah. trying to see what different sorts of norms can be mm -hmm. argued for on the basis of accuracy considerations. Mm -hmm. There are people working on this time slicing question we've yeah. just touched yeah. on. Um, there are also ones, yeah. there are people working on uh, on the relationship between Bayesian subjective probability and knowledge because we've been talking a lot about truth and about beliefs and which beliefs are reasonable and which ones aren't. Um, but epistemology is the study of knowledge. At least that's what it's supposed. <laughs> that's what we tell our students. That's what the it word is. Yeah. Means yeah. Maybe. And so um, so Sarah Moss has been doing some really exciting and interesting work about how to connect the Bayesian approach to epistemology with a, an approach that really actually discusses knowledge. Um, and so we should talk about that in a minute, but to kind of sort of build up to that, um, I think I, I basically agree with a, a lot of Sarah Moss's views, though I, I, I dumb it down a shade just because she's working with some very sophisticated, sophisticated philosophy of language that's right. beyond me. Um, so the view, the sort of the naive version of the view, the one that I, that I, that I can get my head around, the idea is, um, is that, uh, um, a degree of belief, a subjective probability actually can be knowledge and it's it's knowledge that something is probable so for example if i'm 70 percent confident that my horse will win the win the race um then i can actually know that there's a 70 percent probability that the horse will win, will win the race provided that that is actually the correct probability for me to have mm -hmm. and provided that my reasons for having that probability are good reasons in other words if my degree of belief is justified and correct which is similar to sort of the kind of pre-Getty or analysis of knowledge, if I have a justified belief, which is true, um, then I know, and then you could add in a few other qualifiers about it's got to be safe and so on. Um, but yeah, so I think um, if you think that there, there's a correct probability for me to have, then if I have it and I have good reasons for it, then I know. Um, 
But I gather, so uh, you know a bit more about uh, Sarah's more sophisticated version of this view. Do you want to explain a bit about that? Right. So the, the, the version you were just describing, again, has to assume that there is some sense in which there are correct probabilities mm-hmm. that you can be talking about when you say the probability is 70% that this horse will win, because then you can know the proposition mm-hmm. that there is a 70% chance. That's only going to work if there is some meaning for the proposition that it's 70% probable mm-hmm. that the horse will win. Maybe it could be one of these objective probabilities we were talking about earlier. Mm-hmm. Maybe it could be something else we'll get to. Um, I think Sarah's approach is a little bit more flexible than that. And again, some of it's motivated by issues in um, philosophy of language and semantics Mm -hmm. and things like the way certain sorts of expressions like probable and likely get used Mm -hmm. in language, what happens when you embed those expressions in conditionals. Mm -hmm. Um, Can you say something like, it's probable that tomorrow it will be more likely than not to rain, right? So you embed one of them in another. So you start working with that kind of thing, and what she winds up having, and I won't attempt to get into all the details, (laughs) what she winds up thinking is that actually the content expressed by those sorts of probability locutions um, is much more complicated than just a standard proposition that is capable of being true or false. She winds up thinking that what gets expressed is something like a proposition with a probability attached to it, um, mm-hmm. it's actually more complicated than that as a formal structure. It could be sets of those things instead of just one. Mm-hmm. Um, but the idea is, look, if you can express a content like that, you can have an attitude towards a content like that, so you can believe mm-hmm. that it's 70% probable that it will rain tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Um, and notice that in so believing, you are not believing a proposition about objective probabilities right. that's going to be true or false. Somehow you are taking an attitude towards a particular type of content, mm-hmm. and that's kind of expressing your current stance mm-hmm. towards rain or whatever right it's going to be. So they, right and then the the issue is if you can believe those contents why can't you know them mm-hmm. and it sort of moves on moves on from there right so that one advantage of that approach is that it it, it avoids committing to the kind of thing we're going to argue about later you right. can you can have probabilistic knowledge on Sarah Moss's view without having to embrace the kind of view that I like where there's an objective probability underlying it right yeah, yeah. That's it's pretty just cool. What you're doing is, again, it's sort of related to what we were calling the subjective Bayesian approach before, where what's going on in probability expressions is you are somehow reporting or expressing Mm -hmm. something about your own attitudes towards the world. Mm -hmm. It's just now the content and the nature and structure of the content has gotten more complicated. And one of the benefits from her point of view in making it more complicated is we can now think of these contents not just as things that we can assert, Mm -hmm. but also things that we can believe, things we can know, Mm -hmm. things we can communicate to each other, et right. cetera, et cetera. So these intersections between knowledge and, and Bayesianism, I think, are really interesting. Right. So that's one, that's one way that uh, contemporary work on in Bayesian epistemology connects uh, with more traditional work in individual epistemology. But there's also right. some a lot of connections now growing between uh, some individual Bayesian epistemology and group epistemology. Right. So you, I think you know about some of the work in that area. Right, so that's that's an interesting area. It sort of broadly goes under the heading social epistemology. And one of the interesting things about it is it's a sort of burgeoning field, but it results from a bunch of different questions that were being examined in a bunch of different areas mm-hmm. sort of merging together. Mm-hmm. So there has been some discussion in the Bayesian literature for you know at least 10 or 15 years now about questions involving... Um, disagreement between peers. Mm -hmm. So I have an opinion, I run into you, I think you're a pretty competent guy, I find out you have a different (laughs) opinion, how should I respond? Mm -hmm. So that's sort of like the the smallest possible unit of social epistemology is two people interacting (laughs) with each other. There's been a lot of discussion about are there any rules for how we should respond to disagreeing Mm -hmm. peers. That was one thing that was going on. Um, In philosophy of science, there has for a while been some discussion about if you have a bunch of scientists investigating some question, Is there, for instance, a benefit to having diversity among them in the different hypotheses they're exploring? And Mm -hmm. there's some really neat results about how if you have diversity of opinion among the scientists investigating a question, even if some of those diverse opinions are are false, it's going to turn out that having a diversity is going to keep them getting from getting trapped in a certain sort of group think. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to sort of settle on something that looks good, but turns out not to be right and Mm -hmm. just stay there because you're always going to have a few people kind of exploring the margins. Maybe those folks will allow you to, to discover new things. Right. So there's what was going on in Bayesian epistemology. There's what was going on in philosophy of science. There are a lot of interesting issues in sort of 
epistemology more broadly about what it is for a group to have an opinion. Mm -hmm. Can you say that this group of people believes P? Mm -hmm. And if you say that, what does it mean? Mm -hmm. um, does it reduce to every individual in the group has to believe P? Mm -hmm. Does it reduce to um, at least half the individuals believe P? Is there something more complicated going on? Right. Could you have a group that believes P even though no one in the group indiv considered individually believes mm -hmm. P? Um, so there have been a lot of questions you know, even in the metaphysics of belief, can we even meaningfully talk about a group having a belief mm -hmm. or is a belief only the kind of thing that an individual can consider? So these things are all sort of coming together mm -hmm. and there's a lot of interesting work going on in social epistemology mm -hmm. as far as, you know, what are group beliefs? How do we form group beliefs? Mm -hmm. What's the best way to form group beliefs if we want them to be accurate? Mm -hmm. How should we update them as new evidence comes in? Right. Yeah. Yeah, and a lot of that's going to connect with um, another debate that's going on, especially within Bayesianism. And it, it has a long Bayesian tradition, but it also extends outside of Bayesian, which is the debate about um, whether or not, you know, the probabilities that, or the subjective degrees of belief you should have, whether or not they're determined solely by the evidence you have, or whether or not, you know, two people who have the same evidence could reasonably hold different points of view. You might interpret the evidence one way and say, no, I think it's you know, 90% likely that Miami will be underwater in 100 years. And I think, no, I think it's 85% likely. Um, you know, the evidence is big and complicated. It seems like it would be reasonable for climate scientists, to, you know, uh, or schmoes like us to disagree about that. Um, and uh, so, you know, there, there's this question about, well, why if, um, if you hold one view and I hold another, and if there's no objectively correct, you know, probability to have in light of the evidence that we share on this issue, um, why is it that when we meet, we should we should form any kind of epistemic compromise. Why is it that I should say, okay, well, Mike's, you know, more confident than I am, so maybe I should move, a little, increase my confidence a bit because he's pretty reliable. Um, you can make sense of that if there's sort of an objectively correct answer, and I think you might be closer to it than I am. Um, but if there's no objectively correct answer to what, what does the evidence say, then, you know, we might as well just sit here and stare at each other. And I'll, I stay by my 85% and you stay by your 90%. So the social epistemology stuff connects also to this question about whether or not there's a uniquely correct answer probability to hold given a body of evidence um and so, that's somewhere where we really disagree right, this so is the, this is the part where you and i are going to start disagreeing right. do you just want to so this debate often is a debate about a particular thesis called the uniqueness thesis mm -hmm. right um which i think the name the uniqueness thesis was originally put on it by richard feldman mm -hmm. and then richard white wrote an influential article sort of talking more about the uniqueness thesis mm -hmm. interestingly white's article was published before feldman's that's right. So, yeah, yeah. so when you look at the dates, it yeah. always looks like White got there first, but White's very clear that he's borrowing this <laughs> yeah, from yeah. Feldman and he had seen the manuscript of Feldman's article. Do you want to just characterize what the uniqueness thesis says? Sure, says? yeah. Um, so let's leave degrees of belief and probabilities out of it for a moment. Just think about what you should believe simpliciter. Um, the uniqueness thesis says that given a body of evidence, anybody who has that as their evidence, and that's all their evidence, um, they should either believe a given proposition or they should not believe it. Um, and anybody who has that evidence should have the same attitude. So if the evidence mandates belief, then everyone who has that as their evidence should believe it. So there's a unique doxastic attitude, a unique belief state that you should have given that body of evidence. Um, so for example, uh, you know, knowing what you and I know with all the evidence that you and I have, we should believe that uh, you know, we're in Madison, Wisconsin right now. Um, so our evidence mandates that um, belief. Anyone who shared the same evidence, the same information base, and didn't believe that they were in Madison, Wisconsin, would just be irrational. Right. And then if you extend that to degrees of belief, well, then what you get is, given a body of evidence and a hypothesis or a proposition in question, not only is there a unique fact about whether you should believe it or not, there's a unique fact about what probability you should assign it. Um, and this is where things start to get awkward, because it seems like if, you, if everybody has to assign it the same probability, there's this very demanding requirement that we all be exactly 99.38725% confident that we're in Madison right now. And if one of us is a little bit more or a little bit less, it's hard to say that that person's being irrational, just for varying right. so, a little right. bit. Right, so one of the things is if the uniqueness thesis is true in either its belief version or its creedal version, mm -hmm. credence version, um, then if you find two people who have the same evidence mm -hmm. and they disagree about something, you know that at least one of them is failing to measure up rationally, mm -hmm. right? Because, mm -hmm. again, according to the uniqueness thesis, there is one right place they should be, one belief they should have, or mm -hmm. one credence they should have. Um, and if you've got two people doing different things, you know at least one of them isn't doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. 
maybe they're both doing the wrong thing, but at least one of them. So this is how, at least initially, this ties into disagreement. Mm -hmm. You got these two people, they're disagreeing, assuming they have the same evidence or the same relevant evidence Mm -hmm. for the topic they're talking about. At least one of them, if the uniqueness thesis is true, must be making some kind of error. Right. And then you get into this problem. Well, what if it, one's at 99 and one's <laughs> at 98? Really? One of them has made a rational error? Right. Yeah. Um, so I think actually one of the ways that it's important to address that objection to the uniqueness thesis is you can see, and actually just when you look at the Feldman and the White articles, you can see that there are different versions of the uniqueness thesis they're mm-hmm. working with. So one version of the uniqueness thesis is about people. Mm-hmm. It says if you have two people with the same evidence, they should agree on everything. Mm-hmm. Okay. And that starts to look a little tenuous, especially once you start talking about credences and numbers. Mm-hmm. But then there's another thesis that Feldman actually starts with that's really about evidence. Mm-hmm. And what it says is, look, a body of evidence supports particular conclusions mm-hmm. or supports particular credences. And that, in some sense, is an objective fact. Mm-hmm. There's an objective fact about what your evidence supports. Mm-hmm. Right? Um and you might think, look, if there's an objective fact about what my evidence supports, if, say, my evidence supports belief in P, then in order for me to be rational, I should believe P. Mm-hmm. But you might also think that as you know, flawed beings, we get a little <laughs> bit of leeway there. Mm-hmm. So it might be that sort of out there objectively, say, my evidence supports degree of belief 98 in this proposition. Mm-hmm. But, you know, eh. It's good enough if maybe you're at 97 and I'm at 99. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of loosen up on your judgments of people Mm -hmm. as long as you think that underneath the hood there are these facts of the matter about what your evidence supports and how strong that support relation is. Right. So the sort of underlying commitment, I think, of people who believe in the uniqueness thesis is Mm -hmm. there are these objective facts Mm -hmm. about what the evidence supports and the degree to which it is supported. Yeah, as I like to say... There is, because I'm one of the people who actually believes this thesis, I think that there is this platonic heavenly probability (laughs) function, which, you know, none of us can have perfect access to because, you know, Plato, we're all trapped in the cave. But I think it's there and there are objective probabilities that the evidence renders for the proposition. So we said before that we were going to draw (coughs) two different distinctions between objective and subjective Bayesians, right? We said before there's this descriptive distinction, um, and that was about interpretations of probability. That was about... What do you think the word probability means? What are probabilities metaphysically in the world? So that's the descriptive distinction between mm-hmm. objective and subjective Bayesians. And now we're getting onto a different distinction, which we'll call the normative distinction. Mm-hmm. And the normative distinction is about, okay, given that we're now focused on degrees of belief, is there in some sense a correct objective out there in platonic heaven answer to how much a body of evidence supports a particular proposition? That would be in the normative sense, what the objective Bayesian believes. Mm -hmm. The subjective Bayesian thinks there are no such answers out there about what your evidence supports. Mm -hmm. And so two people can disagree and both be rational, and that disagreement can run much, much more deeply (coughs) than the kind of thing where, eh, it supports to degree 98, and you and I are both close, and we're Mm -hmm. almost... No, we can have a much more fundamental disagreement Mm -hmm. where... You take the evidence to, for instance, support belief in P, whereas I take the evidence to support disbelief in P. Mm -hmm. Or you take it to support degree of belief 90% in P, Mm -hmm. and I take it to support 10% in P, and so you're 90% confident in P, I'm 10% confident in P, and neither one of us is being irrational in any way. Mm -hmm. That's the subjective Bayesian position in terms of this divide between objective and subjective and you're an objective Bayesian, right. and I'm a subjective yeah. Bayesian in this sense. Yeah, so right. maybe you could, you could explain. So I, I think this comes out of some of the work you've done um, that comes out of Goodman's classic group paradox. Right. So some of the work you did a few years ago, which um, I gather drove you to the subjective yes. side of this debate. So why don't you right. say a bit about why, right. why you're a subjectivist? Okay, right. So this does come out of thinking about Goodman's group problem, and I don't want to go in too much depth into the group problem and the ways I think it's been interpreted and misinterpreted. But one of the ways to think about it is this. Um, One of the ways to think about group is this. We're we're flooded with all sorts of data, right? And when we get all this information, there are correlations in this information, right? So three people walk into a room. um, They're all men. They're all, you know, over four feet tall. They're all humans. Mm -hmm. And perhaps all of them were born on a Tuesday, 
right? So we have all these correlations about what we know about the three people who have walked into the room this morning. And I think all of us tend to think that some of those correlations perhaps will generalize. Mm -hmm. um, so for instance, it might be that based on what I know about these men, I should expect the next six people who walk into the room to be men. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I should at least expect the next six creatures that walk into the room to be humans. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe I have some background information that influences why this might be a room that only men would enter. You can think of certain kinds of rooms that only men go into, right? Um, but I don't think that when we notice this correlation that all the first three men who walked in were born on a Tuesday, that that's something we should sort of project into the future mm -hmm. and expect to keep going and to keep generalizing. So we do this thing where certain correlations we generalize and then certain of them we view as spurious. Mm -hmm. And to my mind, Goodman's Guru example was just a particularly poignant illustration of certain correlations mm -hmm. are good for projection and generalization and certain of them are spurious. So then you have this question of, given any body of data, which correlations should you count on and mm -hmm. which ones should you treat as spurious? Um, and this hooks into this whole objective versus subjective Bayesian debate because the objective Bayesian who thinks there's this evidential support relation out there in Plato's heaven is going to say, look, give me the body of data. There's the fact of the matter about mm -hmm. if I were being rational, which correlations I would generalize and which I would just ignore, mm -hmm. right? Okay, so this argument I made is I said, okay, look, suppose there is such a fact of the matter, okay? How do we learn about that thing? Because it's really important that we come to know about it, right? Because, you know, if it's out there in Plato's heaven, that's great. But if I can't find out what my evidence supports, mm -hmm. how am I ever going to do science? How am I ever going to kind of guide myself around the world? Mm -hmm. um, I need some way to know how I'm supposed to interpret my evidence. It's not good enough just to be confident that there is some right way to do it. i got to be able to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And there are a couple options. One of them is that these sort of platonic truths are a priori. And there are some reasons why I think that doesn't work very well. Mm -hmm. um, another option is to say, no, 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 these facts are out there in the world. They're not a priori. They're contingent. They're mm -hmm. a posteriori. But if that's your option, then I'm left to wonder, again, how do we find out about these things? Mm -hmm. Because you would think that if, for instance, they are scientific truths about the world, mm -hmm. which are the good correlations, um, well, how do we learn about scientific truths? We gather a bunch of evidence, we gather a bunch of data, and then we generalize. Mm -hmm. But the whole problem is I don't know what generalizations to make what correlations to pay attention to. I don't know how to draw scientific conclusions from data until I first know, mm -hmm. right, what are the good correlations. And so I'm sort of trapped in this loop mm -hmm. where if, if the truths about the good correlations are out there in the universe and are scientifically discoverable, mm -hmm. in order to discern them from my data, I first have to know what they are, mm -hmm. and, and then I'm trapped. Yeah, so there are echoes here of Hume's classic problem of induction, yes. where you, if it's a priori, it seems like it's not going to work. If it's a, a posteriori, it seems like you run in a circle. Yeah. And so you get stuck with, there's, if, there are, if there is this platonic heavenly probability function, no one could know what it is, and then it fails to do the job it was supposed yes. to do to begin with. Right, yeah. which is why Goodman called his problem the new riddle of induction, mm -hmm. right? You can think about it as, so we've got these data and we've noticed these correlations, and Hume's problem is, why generalize at all? What, mm -hmm. what justifies us in thinking that the correlations we've noticed are going to extend to the next person who walks, or the next creature who walks into the room? Mm -hmm. And Goodman says, okay, suppose we've just decided we're allowed to generalize. We still have this problem. Which of the correlations are the mm -hmm. good ones to generalize and which are spurious? And you run into some of the same problems. Either you can decide on an a priori basis, mm -hmm. and that just looks really implausible, at least from my point of view, mm -hmm. um, or there's a true answer and you can't figure it out mm -hmm. at all, and that, that looks bad for mm -hmm. me. So there is another way to go. And the other way to go is to be a subjective Bayesian. Mm -hmm. And what the subjective Bayesian says is, look, there is no one right answer. There are no truths out there in Platonic Heaven. Mm -hmm. There are different ways of approaching this. There are different sort of, each of us brings to the table a different set of, let's call them evidential standards. Mm -hmm. Your evidential standards help you figure out which features of your evidence are you gonna pay attention to? How are you gonna weight them against each other? How are you going to use your evidence to draw out hypotheses? Mm -hmm. But ultimately, your evidential standards don't just derive from the evidence. Mm -hmm. At least some element of your standards is something you bring to the table. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it comes from who knows how we're wired you know, cognitively. Perhaps it comes from your society. Perhaps it has to do with how you were raised, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And the key point is someone else is going to come to the table with something else. Mm -hmm. And the evidence ultimately can't adjudicate which one of you mm -hmm. is doing a better job. And so ultimately, each of you, in applying different evidential standards, is being equally 
rational. Mm -hmm. There are, there is no one true set of rational evidential standards Mm -hmm. out there in platonic heaven. Mm -hmm. What there is, is there are different rational evidential standards. There are some rules, there are some restrictions, Mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, you're going to find different ways of approaching evidence. Mm -hmm. And because different rational individuals can have different rational ways of approaching evidence, Mm -hmm. two rational individuals who appraise the same evidence may draw different conclusions. Mm -hmm and be doing just fine. Mm-hmm. And so the uniqueness thesis turns out to be false on this right. view. So on, on your way of thinking about it, um, each sort of way of assigning probabilities to all the possibilities that could ever obtain, each one of those encodes a kind of epistemic right. standard, a sort of way of sort of weighing the evidence right. and, and assessing the information, yeah. Um, and I guess what makes me uncomfortable about that is the same thing that makes Roger White uncomfortable about that. And so I think he's done the most to give voice to this argument. And I think he's essentially right that if you take that point of view, um, then whatever judgments you make based on your epistemic standards, um, or prior probabilities, as Bayesians might prefer to call them, whatever judgments you make on that basis, you're going to think to yourself, well, you know, I've got these sets of epistemic standards, but here's, you know, someone else who has different epistemic standards, right? They tend to think that, uh, you know, um, things, you know, whatever happens is, um, you know, is the the hand of some you know some devious some devious being who's you know meddling with our right. meddling with our environment, and so you know there's a way of understanding of interpreting everything which is perfectly res- probabilistically consistent, but which radically changes the way you interpret everything that, all the information that you get. Um, and I'm going to look at my standards and their standards and think, well, you know, from an objective point of view or a neutral point of view, I should say, um, my standards are just as good as theirs. So why should I believe mine? Why should I believe the conclusions I've drawn? Why not just adopt their standards instead and believe something completely different, maybe nothing at all, if their standards are extremely skeptical? Um, And so uh, the way Roger puts it is in terms of belief toggling or flip-flopping, right, where your beliefs change as you think, well, this set of standards is reasonable, and I interpret my evidence in light of them, or no, these standards are are reasonable too, interpret my evidence in terms of them instead, kind of waffle back and forth and constantly change what I believe. Um, and as I was saying, this creates this feeling of instability where I find myself thinking, oh, I just can't believe anything <laughs> if, I, right. if I don't think that there's a one unique correct way to interpret right. the evidence. Right. So this, this is a problem I'm also very worried about. Mm-hmm. I think it's worth narrowing down precisely where the problem is supposed to be. Mm-hmm. I think there are a few different versions of it floating around, and there's one that's really worrying, but it's worth sort of identifying and discarding sure, yeah. the other ones. So a couple of things that I don't think are really the core of the problem. So first of all, there's something you articulated a while back, which is you said, look, if there's not one objective standard, then when I meet someone who disagrees with me, why should I change my opinions at all? And this is a concern that I think Tom Kelly very nicely expressed. And he said, look, if it's rash, suppose we've got some body of evidence and it's rationally permissible for me to be at, I don't know, 0.69 on some proposition. But I know that... Uh, it would also be rational to be anywhere near 0.7. Mm-hmm. And then I run into you, and you're at 0.71 on the same proposition, given mm-hmm. the same evidence. Tom Kelly said, look, why should I m- change at all? Why should I do anything in response to what I just learned? Because mm-hmm. I knew it was permissible for some people to be at 6, 0.71. I knew that before I put myself at 0.69. I encounter you, okay, fine, you're at 0.71. Great, you know, <laughs> you're doing just fine. Um, I'm okay, you're there, okay. Yeah, right. Why is there any <laughs> impetus for me to move? And so you, get, if you have this assumption going in that sometimes when we encounter equally intelligent people who disagree with us, maybe we should sort of conciliate and move towards the, that point of view. Mm-hmm. That looks really hard to reconcile with a subjective Bayesian point of view, mm-hmm. right? Um, I actually think that argument doesn't work very well. Okay. And um, so Matt Kopek and I have been writing this paper called Plausible Permissivism, where we try to figure out if you're a subjective Bayesian, sometimes subjective Bayesians are also known as permissivists, people mm-hmm. who deny the uniqueness thesis are known as per. So what are you really committed to? And one of the questions is, are you committed to this idea that when two peers meet each other, neither one has to move towards each other? Mm-hmm. And I actually think there are all sorts of reasons why, even if I recognize that what I was doing before was rational and what you were doing was rational, mm-hmm. I can still, when I learn about your opinions, decide that I might want to move your way. Mm-hmm. So for instance, Go back to the sort of accuracy, truth trackingness considerations we were talking about before. Um, I could think that um, there are a lot of rationally permissible ways to parse evidence, but as an evolutionary matter, 
if I had a way of parsing evidence that didn't give me truths most of the time, I would have, you know, been eaten by something <laughs> that I didn't see coming or run over mm -hmm. by. So I might think that, in fact, the people I'm likely to find in the world probably have evidential standards that are pretty good at tracking the truth. Mm -hmm. And so when I then find you in the world, and I assume that you have evidential standards that are pretty good at tracking the truth, mm -hmm. um, maybe I should listen to what what you have to say, mm -hmm. and maybe I should take into account what you had to say, mm -hmm. without denying that what I was doing before was just as rationally permissible as what you were doing before. Mm -hmm. So you might get that even for someone who denies the uniqueness thesis, it's still possible for people who have disagreeing and equally rational mm -hmm. points of view to, to conciliate or meet in the middle a little bit okay. once they meet each other. So that's one, that's one thing that I think a bunch of people have been worried about that I am not so concerned okay. about. Um, another version is another thing you said a minute ago about worrying about agents hopping back and forth between mm -hmm. different things. So again, take this case where I think that anything in the vicinity of 0.7 would be okay, mm -hmm. and I'm at 0.69. Why shouldn't I just jump over to 0.71, and mm -hmm. then maybe later I'll be at 0.73, and then maybe it would be fun tomorrow to be at 0.65, mm -hmm. just, you know, whatever. Um, and this is one of the issues that Roger White brings up. Mm -hmm. And this sort of standard subjective Bayesian lore has always been that there are rules about how you have to update mm -hmm. your degrees of belief, this conditionalization rule we were talking about before. Mm -hmm. And so what happens if you believe in those rules is once someone has settled onto a particular evidential standard, mm -hmm. they are committed to it. Mm -hmm. And that evidential standard governs how they update going forward. Mm -hmm. And if that particular person were to jump somewhere else, mm -hmm. then they would be violating the requirements of rationality. Mm -hmm. So if I'm at 0.69 now and I jump to 0.71, that's a violation of the updating rules and that's not mm -hmm. okay. Even though you could be at 0.71 because you started at 0.71, mm -hmm. right? As I said before, you had a different starting point than I did. Mm -hmm. So a very traditional subjective point, Bayesian point of view is we have these starting points, sometimes called priors. Mm -hmm. And once you have a prior, once you have a set of evidential standards, mm -hmm. you're locked into that. Mm -hmm. And that dictates how you should move going forward, mm -hmm. and it keeps you from kind of jumping around. Mm -hmm. But for any, you know, just because any given person is locked in doesn't mean you can't have two different people who are locked into different things. Right, so a number right. of people I think ag have agreed with you there, like Chris Meacham, Igor Dubin, Tom Kelly, right. they've all offered this, uh, what Kelly calls the interpersonal versus intrapersonal mm -hmm. distinction, where they say, well, Bayesianism allows interpersonal variation, where if you start with one set of standards, I start with another, then you know we'll interpret the evidence differently over time, but there's no point at which one person sort of you know gets to switch from one evidential right. standard to another and flip flop their beliefs. Um, now, one question you could raise at this point is, well, why is it that there are these rules about how I should? Why why am I locked into an evidential mm -hmm. standard? Um, and Miriam Sch Miriam Schoenfeld gives a, an answer in a recent paper where she says, well, look, uh, if you consider moving to another epistemic standard from your present point of view, you'll think, well. You know, what, what, I hold my epistemic standards because these are the ones that I think will lead me, are most likely to get me to the truth. If I change my epistemic standards, I'll be setting myself on the road <laughs> right. to the false, which would be a terrible thing. Right. And so you, she argues you can actually give a rationale for the, the locking in, for the staying with the epistemic standards um, that you have. And I guess one thing I wonder is, do you, do you agree with that, um, that way of explaining why there's locking in, or do you think that there's another way of tackling this issue right. that you prefer. Right. So this is interesting because it goes back a little bit to the time slicing issue mm -hmm. we were discussing before. Right. Um, so a time slicing point of view, if you are a time slicer and a subjective Bayesian, mm -hmm. right, you have a real problem. <laughs> okay. If you're a time slicer and an objective Bayesian, then your story is, look, there is one rational place to be given mm -hmm. your evidence. And so at any given time, you should just look at your evidence and do what the evidence says. And over time, as long as your evidence stays constant, mm -hmm. there's only one right thing to do. So you're going to keep doing the same thing over and over and over. But that's not for any interesting diachronic reason. Mm -hmm. It's not like what you did before is influencing what you do now. Mm -hmm. It's just at every given moment you're looking at your evidence. And as long as your evidence stays the same, mm -hmm. you're going to have the same attitudes. Because mm -hmm. there's only one right attitude to have given your evidence. Mm -hmm. So if you're a time slicer and an object of Bayesian, that looks fine. And people are just going to sort of carry on in a nice, mellow way and not be <laughs> jumping all over the place. But if you're a time slicer and a subjective Bayesian, mm -hmm. then look, again, suppose you take this case where my evidence allows me to be anywhere sort of in the vicinity of 0.7. Mm -hmm. Well, the fact that I was at 0 0.69 five minutes ago mm -hmm. doesn't bear in any way on what I should be doing now. And so it doesn't look like there can be any reason for me to be not just be at 0 0.71 right now mm -hmm. or be at some other thing. And I could presumably just, mm -hmm. you know, hop all over the place. And so 
these norms I was talking about before, like conditionalization, mm -hmm. as a truly diachronic norm that requires you to honor what you did before, mm -hmm. even if what you did before wasn't forced on you by your evidence. Mm -hmm. Time slicers aren't going to go for that thing, mm -hmm. um, and so a time slicing subjective Bayesian might wind up in this position we're jumping. Okay, right. so if, to, to answer your question, so being a subjective Bayesian, um, personally, I'm not a time slicer, and I think that there really are these important diachronic norms mm -hmm. that require you to honor what you were doing mm -hmm. before. Um, I don't tend to defend them the way that Miriam Schoenfeld does. Mm -hmm. I don't tend to do it in terms of accuracy, um, in part because I just... I don't work in the accuracy-based framework. Um, one of the things we didn't talk about before is the accuracy-based framework is sort of teleological. It's all mm -hmm. about moving towards a goal. Right. The goal is accuracy. It's, some people characterize it as a version of epistemic consequentialism. Mm -hmm. And just like in ethics, we have reservations about consequentialism. Mm -hmm. There have been a recent group of people, Jennifer Carr, Slim Berker, um, who have raised various issues about mm -hmm. epistemic consequentialism. Right. And I tend to be sympathetic to that, so I'm less likely to give these accuracy Same here. Yeah, right, right. I think you and I are... Roughly on the same page as that. Um, okay, so wait, we've said all these things that the instability concern isn't, mm -hmm. right? So it, so even a subjective Bayesian, if you can successfully tell one of these diachronic stories, mm -hmm. doesn't think it's okay for one particular individual to jump around, mm -hmm. okay? But I do think that there is a concern left over about the subjective Bayesian position. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you have that concern. Do you want to try to say more precisely exactly what the instability concern is? Um. I think it's just, I mean, I think if you could justify the diachronic norms, it would be fine. I think my my concern really just is um, uh, that uh, at any given moment, you've still got this, you know, suppose I, well, I should say actually that uh, it's only when you, so if you, if you can't justify the diachronic norms, then we go back to the instability problem. If you can justify the diachronic norms, um, then I think the problem might be, the flip-flopping problem might be right. solved, but then we need a justification, right. which is hard to give. Um, but, I mean, you've, you've been working on this, so... <laughs> right, right. And, and, and we should say the reason we are both in the same location is we just finished doing a conference that was largely about this mm -hmm. issue of why should yeah. agents be diachronically consistent over time. Um, maybe rather than get into that, maybe there's another way to characterize part of the thing you're worried about that... Mm -hmm generates the instability concern but isn't confined to the instability concern okay I mean, one way that i've put it is it's a concern about authority right sort yeah. of and when, when you said before why should i believe anything mm -hmm. right there's this concern that look if i've got an evidential standard mm -hmm. but i know that from some point of view all these other evidential standards would be equally good mm -hmm. then how can i maintain my allegiance to the standard i've got mm -hmm. from my own point of view it looks kind of arbitrary that I'm doing the particular thing that I am. I'm mm -hmm. here at 0.69. I know I would have been equally good to be at 0.71. Mm -hmm. You might wonder in some case, I mean, in some sense, given that I know all these things are equally okay, what what authorizes me to, to be mm -hmm. at the one that I'm at as opposed to some other? Mm -hmm. um, and why, you know, as we said before, even though contemporary Bayesian epistemology isn't as much driven by decision theory, mm -hmm. these things are tied to decisions. They're mm -hmm. tied to not just gambles, but decisions you make in your life mm -hmm. about should I, you know, take the job that's been offered to me or should I hold out for this other job? Mm -hmm. That's going to depend on how confident you are that the other job is, is going <laughs> to be, right? Important life decisions mm -hmm. depend on these things. Mm -hmm. And so if you're going to be making all sorts of decisions, both practical and epistemic, based on these degrees of belief, and you have a degree of belief, but there's nothing in your evidence that tells you you have to have that mm -hmm. one as opposed to these other ones, mm -hmm and those other ones look equally rational, you mm -hmm. might think that that kind of undermines the degree of belief you have. Mm -hmm. And as you put it before, it, if it gets suitably undermined, you might be at this position where I'm like, I can't take any of these, mm -hmm. right? It, if, if none of them is forced, then none of them is available. In some sort yeah. Of like Maybe that's the same as... So there's another way of putting it that I got from my colleague, Gurpreet Rutan, which I find really helpful. And this may be slightly different, or it might be just another way of putting it. Um, I like to think about it in terms of perspectives, and and one of the things that um, Bayesianism famously ignores is the fact that we can take different perspectives. It's not just the degrees of belief we have right now. We can kind of step back from the beliefs we have right now and say, well, you know, I took this evidence to support that hypothesis, but let me step back and reevaluate. And just as you can step back from a conclusion you've drawn, you can step back from the evidence based upon which you drew it, and then you can step back from the epistemic standards that le led you to draw that conclusion from that piece of evidence. And at each level, it seems like, as you were putting it, um, the, the level you step back to, you're employing a set of standards which has authority over 
the previous level. So as you step farther and farther back, presumably you're getting to a more authoritative point of view. After all, if you step back from a conclusion you draw and you think, actually, the correct application of my epistemic standard says believe the opposite of what I thought, well, then you should go change your beliefs. And in that sense, the more neutral perspective is the more authoritative. Um, and so even if you could kind of get a, an argument for conditionalization at any, at any moment, I would then step back and think, well, I've been using these epistemic standards and conditionalizing on them, but what's really authoritative is this, the perspective I can step back to where I think, well, should I have been conditionalizing using these epistemic standards? Um, and then I think, well, if you deny the uniqueness thesis, then you say, well, there's a perspective from which I can see that this set of standards is just as good at getting at the truth right. as this set of standards. And this is the perspective that has authority. It's the, it's the more neutral one, the one from which I decide which set of standards to embrace. And since it's authoritative, I can, once I step back to it, go either left or right, and then draw whatever conclusions, if I go left, whatever conclusions come from that, um, come from that set of epistemic standards. If I go right, I draw a different set of conclusions. And at any point I can do this and find myself waffling. And then after, again, as we said earlier on, I've, after doing this enough times, I'll start to think, there's no more point, I'll just right. not believe anything. Right, so it doesn't have to be a problem of you actually jump from one approach to another. It's sort of you're at one approach, but then once you adopt this, right. this point of view, it kind of undermines what you're doing and yeah. it's unclear that you can stick with it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I want to ask you about that is I think there's an interesting contrast between the belief case we're talking about and, say, the case of preferences, mm -hmm. right? So... When people talk about preferences, they talk about silly things like flavors of ice cream. Mm -hmm. But suppose we do something that has a little bit more substance to it. Suppose we're going to movies. We're going to choose a movie. Mm -hmm. um, and you and I are just interested in different things about movies, mm -hmm. right? So you're interested in the characters and the quality of the dialogue. And I'm interested <laughs> in the adrenaline rush and things blowing up. And I want to see cars jumping from one building to another. Who knows, right? Um so, and, and if I'm going to go out and choose a movie, I'm going to do it on the basis of that kind of stuff. If you're going to go choose a movie, you're going to do it on the basis of you know, whatever these things are that you think are important. <laughs> and there's some sense in which I can kind of step back and recognize there's some point of view from which I can recognize, look, Jonathan has the things he's interested in in mm -hmm. cinema. I have the things I'm interested in in cinema mm -hmm. from some you know, more objective point of view, it's not like his interests are any better than mine mm -hmm. or mine are more right than his. Mm -hmm. In that case, though, I feel like my ability to step back to this more authoritative point of view mm -hmm. in no way undermines my commitment to what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I step back and I say, you know, hey, Jonathan's got different interests than me. His interests in some sense are just as valid as mine. I still want to go see the movie where things blow up. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's a case where being able to adopt this more authoritative point of view and seeing that no one thing is better than any other from that mm -hmm. point of view doesn't undermine my commitment to the mm -hmm. particular apparently idiosyncratic and arbitrary thing that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So I take it you feel like the evidential standards case is different from the sort of preference <laughs> case, right? And I'm curious I Actually, why. sometimes I wonder if they're, if they're really that different. So um, people, in, especially in the Bayesian and decision theoretic tradition, they talk about preferences as if they had a kind of subjectivity to them that I'm actually not entirely sure they do. And oftentimes they try to argue, well, you know, look, you could attribute a lot of value to, you know, to, like you say, getting vanilla or seeing an action movie, I could attribute a lot of value to um, having chocolate or, you know, going to see Uncle Vanya or whatever right. <laughs> horrible, <laughs> torturous experience I want to whatever put you through. Whatever you're into. Yeah, right, yeah. yeah. Um, and I think there's a line of thinking that, I, that I, I heard through Brian Head, and I don't know if he endorses it, but this is a line of thinking that kind of draws me in. It's, it's this thinking where it says, well, you know, it's just, uh, you know, there's, there's an objective thing to value here, namely, you know, uh, you know in, enjoying your theatrical experience, having a ple pleasurable gastronomic experience. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just that the facts on the ground are different for you and me, the facts on the ground. Are, and so that's a little bit like having different evidence. But... Um, but, you know, there is, you know, given what the facts on the ground are, given that these are the things I enjoy and these are the things you enjoy, there's an objective fact about what I should prefer for me. And then there's an objective fact about what I should prefer for our joint choice, because, you know, I should prefer something that I won't suffer too much and you won't suffer too much. And that's a fair compromise. Um, so I actually I, I might even be willing to go all the way towards the objective spectrum and and abandon the subjectivity that's often under, that's often pushed onto utilities as well. Right. So this is, this is an interesting, what has traditionally been an asymmetry is once you start making these comparison be comparisons between the practical and the epistemic realm, mm -hmm. um, just traditionally, 
whatever the analog would be of the uniqueness thesis for action, mm -hmm. very few people have been willing to endorse, <laughs> right? So traditionally, you have problems like Buridan's ass or choosing your f flavor of ice cream, mm -hmm. where people have sort of denied the uniqueness thesis and said, look, mm -hmm. there are a lot of possible desires or intentions that could be permissible, and it's okay for different people to choose different ones, and they're still equally rational. Mm -hmm. So the traditional position has been to deny the uniqueness thesis for actions, for choices among desires mm -hmm. and preferences, but then perhaps for many people to endorse it for evidential standards and beliefs. Mm -hmm. the, the position you were just outlining says sort of, at a particular level of abstraction, there is a true uniqueness thesis for actions, mm -hmm. right? Whatever would give you the most enjoyable cinematic experience. Mm -hmm. We all agree that that's what you should go <laughs> right. for in choosing yeah. movies. Um, that's a new approach. I don't yeah, know it's, it, it, I admit that it's extreme. <laughs> it's but controversial. <laughs> may have a certain uh, internal coherence. Yeah, I think in both cases, though, there's a bigger picture question, which is, do we need there to be an objective answer, hmm. right? Do we need there to be this authoritative perspective that lands on one platonic truth? And if there weren't such a thing, would it undermine our ability to sort of carry out our idiosyncratic points of view, whether it would be with respect to intentions and desires or mm -hmm. with respect to beliefs? When I believe something, do I have to think that that belief is the one unique thing picked out by my evidence? Mm -hmm. If I fail to think that I have that sort of authoritative backing, is it somehow going to undermine my belief? Mm -hmm. Or can I recognize my, re excuse me, reconcile myself to this level of arbitrariness in what mm -hmm. I believe. And even then, without the backing of some sort of objective authority, still have the belief or still have the credence and mm -hmm. still let it play the role in my life that, you know, these things importantly have to play. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I guess, the, yeah, I'm, I still, when I, there's a moment where I can almost kind of feel that I can reconcile that sort of the arbitrariness of that selection with, you know, without, with, you know, uh, the worry about it starting to lead to slipperiness and then it, slips away from me <laughs> ironic but i think we're actually are we out of time yeah i think, I think so. we are all right so maybe we'll just leave it there all right. all right this has been great Thanks. good talk good <laughs> We need one of Your those, picks. what yeah. do you call those? A clapper, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have enough money for a clapper. Oh. Maybe, maybe some other. Okay.